Donald and Douglas were rushed off their wheels. Sir so Chapman Hat came to see them. I know you don't mind hard work, but you can't be everywhere at once. You need some help on the branch lines. The Scottish twins were grateful. I have a plan. He went to see a friend who lived in Gloucestershire and explained the problem. The friend took him to meet Wilbert, a small blue sound tank engine with six wheels. Your owner says you can come and help me for a while. Would you like that? Wilbert was delighted. Yes, please, sir. His line in the forest of Dean was short, and he was delighted for the chance to exercise his wheels. If you're as good as I think you will be, I know where I can get another engine like you, and then you will be able to go back home. Percy was excited when he heard the news. Another cell tank, sir? Is he like me? <laughs> He's bigger and stronger than you, Percy. Besides, you can manage your trucks. I want him to help duck, so I'm afraid you may not even meet him. During the week before Wilbert came, it was cold and wet. The engines thought it would never stop raining. None of them wanted to go out, but passengers and trucks were waiting. Just the sort of weather we need porridge for breakfast. Laughed Percy's driver. What's porridge? It's... it's well... difficult to describe. Admitted the fireman. You boil oatmeal and water. Which makes a sort of sticky soup. Then you add milk and sugar. Delicious. At the station by the river, sacks were being stacked on the platform. The men who had filled them had worked fast, and they had not tied the sacks properly, as the porter lifted the last stack. Better hurry. Here's Percy. The oatmeal inside the sacks burst out, covering everything. The pouring rain quickly turned it into a sort of sticky soup. Percy wasn't going fast, but he couldn't prevent himself from ploughing into the porridge which now covered the rain. The porridge dripped from Percy's wheels, rods and frames. He felt awful, wet, sticky and cold. His driver and fireman got down to inspect the mess. Oh dear. Well, Percy, you found out about porridge the hard way, haven't you? The thing is, you're supposed to eat it, not paddle in it. Percy didn't think it was funny. Sir Topham Hatt wasn't amused either. He telephoned the junction, where they were just in time to stop Wilbur on his way to Duck's branch line. He came along Thomas's line instead, and soon reached the shed at the top station. Percy cheered up at once. I wanted to meet you, but I didn't think it would be this way. Porridge is alright for breakfast, <laughs> my driver said, but it makes a mess of an engine who's not expecting it. Your luck to have a long line. Mine is only one and a half miles long, with a station at Norchard and another at Lydney. The scenery is superb though, my driver says it's better up the valley. Our volunteers are going to open up that bit too. They work hard, but it takes a long time. One of Wilbert's first jobs was at the lead mine. Don't pass the danger notice. I fell down a mine once. I've worked in a colliery, so I know about danger notices. But there was an engine who thought he knew better. What, what happened? happened? This engine didn't have a name, but just a number. Sixteen. And he worked in the steelworks. One of the jobs Sixteen and his friends had was to take the waste from the works in special trucks to replace the gold in the tin. Well, Sixteen got tired of always stopping in the same place. He tried to go further, but his driver always prevented him. The other engines and I tried to stop him too. If the notice said, Danger, you shouldn't pass it, I said. Sixteen paid no attention. Don't be stupid. We mustn't pass the notice, or goodness knows where we shall end up. But Sixteen wanted to. Pooh! I can sight care of myself. One wet day, Sixteen's chance came. The rails were slippery, and when his driver tried to stop, he couldn't. You see, Sixteen had asked the trucks, which were in front of him, to carry on past the warming cycle. They did just that and their momentum pulled 16 with them. You silly engine. It wasn't my fault. It was those trucks. 
You've always wanted to pass that board. I believe you asked them to drag us on purpose. A foreman ran towards them. What are you doing there, driver? It's not safe. The trucks dragged us. Well, come to the office with me, and you, fireman, get your engine back on firm ground before it's too late. But it was already too late. Sixteen's fireman knew that if he tried to move the engine now, he would only make things worse. Ooh, uh... And he rolled cab over wheels to the bottom of the bank. And he reached the bottom of the trash. Hello. Thomas and Toby were silent. What happened to Sixteen after that? Oh, he was rescued, but he wasn't repaired. And he was sent back to the shed in disgrace. Is he still there? He got better than he deserved. Some preservation people came and bought him, and now he lives in the Midlands. But I think he's lucky to have been given a second chance. Thomas and Toby could only agree. There is a dairy beside Thomas's branch line. At the station where the lines divide to either go to the harbour or to the junction. Every afternoon, special tanker wagons are pushed into the dairy siding. They're filled with milk, and Percy takes them to the junction every morning. Thomas explained this to Gilbert. There's a hose pipe thing which puts the milk into the tankers. They'll be ready by the time you get there for the first train. Sounds easy enough. Thomas told them a great many other details, too. Wilbert listened carefully, trying hard to remember them all. The next day, he enjoyed himself. He was a much more powerful engine than Percy, so he found that he could cope easily with Percy's trains. The trucks behaved well, too, which was a help. He's strong, he is. Don't upset him. You never know what he might do to get his own back. One day, Wilbur took loaded stone trucks to the harbor. On his way back with empty ones, he stopped at the station by the dairy and pushed the empty trucks into a side. He left them and set out towards the junction with just a few bags. Right, I have to leave these vans at the junction and bring the empty tankers back. Then, when those are put in the dairy siding, I take the stone trucks on to the top station. They met James at the junction. James knew who Wilbur was, of course, and asked how he was getting on. Wilbur chattered excitedly about the jobs he had been given to do that day. Sounds as if you're enjoying yourself, but it's best to take things slowly at first. continued his journey and reached the dairy station easily. His fireman was worried about water. We should have filled up at the junction, but you were busy chatting with James. Never mind, we'll get water here. The tankers were at the end of the train, so all we had to do was to push them into the dairy side. Then he drew forward and stopped behind the hose pipe. Just in time. As he turned the tap, the driver spoke to him. The fireman went to fly, but when he returned, he found that Wilbur had stopped at the wrong hose pipe. His tank was full, but not with water, with milk. You'll be foaming at the funnel if any of this gets in the boiler, gasped the driver. Quickly, they put out Wilbur's fire, and the fireman telephoned for help. Thomas came as soon as he could and pulled Wilbur back to the top station. Wilbert's tank was emptied and given a thorough clean. The next morning he was quite alright again. You and Percy make a fine pair. He had the porridge and you had the milk. As 
soon as Percy came home, Sir Topham Hart came to see Wilbert. You've done well so far, apart from drinking all that milk. Wilbert looked abashed. I'm sorry, sir, I... It's all right, Wilbert. A mistake any engine could make. But now Percy is back, you can go and help on Duck's branch line. Wilbert puffed away. Percy and the others were sorry to see him go. Doc and Oliver made Wilbert very welcome. Doc let him travel in front of his next train so that he could see what the line was like. Wilbert enjoyed this, but found running beside the sea very different from his sheltered valley in Gloucestershire. The next day he began regular work. During the afternoon he took some ballast wagons to the ballast contractions. Like the other trucks, those on Duck's line decided that they had better behave too. Donald and Douglas had kept them in order, but Wilbur made sure they didn't forget that the twins had talked. One day Wilbur was at the ballast loader. As he tried to pull some full trucks away, there was a loud crack and he suddenly shot backwards. The fireman got down to look. The coupling gear on the wagon has pulled away. Now what? Beside them, watching with interest, was Duck. One of the small engines pulled a train which was glued together once, when one of his couplings broke. We need more than glue, Hugh. Then he noticed a coil of signal wire lying beside the line. Could we do anything with that? You'd never move a train with wire. But what about just one truck? I bet I could pull one truck with wire. Brilliant, said the station master, who had come to see what was wrong. I'll go and tell the signal what you're doing. Be sure to let me know when you're ready. And at last, everything was ready. Right, Wilbert. Gently now. The wire tightened, stretched, and held. Slowly the truck followed Wilbert out of the siding. And then he could push it into another, out of the way. Then he went back to his ballast train. This time, there was no trouble. He reached the big station late and safe. By the end of his stay, Sir Tuffin Hatt knew that an engine like Wilbert was exactly what he needed. I am delighted, Wilbert. Please take our best wishes to your friends in the Forest of Dean. We hope your line there will be as successful as your work here. Thomas, Percy, Toby and Daisy came to the junction to see Wilbert off and whistled cheerfully as he passed. I've had a wonderful time, but I'm looking forward to getting home. Goodbye and thank you. And with a whistle, he rounded the curve and disappeared into the tunnel.